Okay. Yes, so once upon a time, a long, very long time ago, there was a people known as the Romans. And of course, you all know a lot about the Romans. Uh, they are famous for being very good engineers. Uh, they created paved roads, aqueducts, great buildings that are still standing today. Uh, a little bit less well known is that they also invented the modern sleek tablet computer. <laughs> <laughs> so this is actually uh, it's a pocket-sized bronze abacus that, uh, from ancient Rome that Roman engineers could use to do a lot of advanced calculations. Um, and they had to use a computer because the number system they had, the Roman numerals, are not very good for doing arithmetic. Uh, of course, yeah, they're pretty much good for one thing, and that is writing down a number. It's easy to see that this is a 23rd C plus Sweden C++ meetup, or Stockholm C++ meetup. But uh, have you tried doing arithmetic with Roman numerals? It's addition, subtraction is relatively easy, but multiplication, it's quite a lot more complicated. Um, and yeah, also engineers need more numbers than the natural numbers. But let's go back even further in time. So where do the natural numbers come from? That's basically how math started. And this is a picture of the Ishanga bone. This is very early archaeological finding from uh, of mathematical nature. It's, it was found in the Ishanga region, which is modern day Democratic Republic of Congo. It's over 20,000 years old. Uh, and it's not very clear here, perhaps, but there are, it's full of these little scratches that are made by uh, some human hand. Uh, and they are not just random scratches. Actually, if you look at them a little bit closer, there are kind of three rows. On the first row, there is kind of a series of doublings. You have three, six, four, eight. And there's a 10 followed by two groups of five. Uh, and the second two rows are all odd numbers. In fact, on the f second middle row there is all prime numbers, and they both add up to 60. So there seems to be some mathematical thinking going here. Uh, and yeah, this is how we believe that natural numbers started. Like you just count things and make some kind of marks. So like a prehistoric definition, this is a unary system. You make a dot or line or something to count things. Uh, and we could implement such a number type in C++ if we wanted to. So this is a Stone Age uh, natural number type. It's just a standard string of dots. So we start with one, and if a Stone Age person comes with a string of different characters, different things they want to count, we just create a string of dots. That long, and we can do arithmetic with this. Um, but of course, it's not very practical. The strings grow quite long. If the number grows large, it becomes difficult to see uh, like how, many, how big is this number. It's a lot of work to do the calculations. So the next natural step is to group the numbers into equal sized groups somehow and invent new symbols, which many ancient civilizations came up with independently of each other. So that's an example from the uh, Babylonians used a base 60 system. They pressed reeds into uh, clay tablets. And they used a different way, they did it in a different way for the tens to keep the digits manageable. Uh, like on a different continent, the Mayans, they had a base 20 system where they had like horizontal lines for the fives and so on. And of course, this is how Roman numerals work as well. It's the same basic idea. Uh, makes it possible to write much larger numbers. Uh, and well, the next step, of course, by the time the Roman Empire started to disintegrate, the uh, Indians, of course, invented the modern number system that went through the Far East and the Arab world. And it took a very long time until the beginning of the 13th century when Fibonacci brought these numbers to Western Europe. Yes? So it's the Mayan on the, on the right there. This is a Mayan numbers. Yeah. This so is they, a Babylonian. Yeah, and uh, 
I don't know exactly if they thought of it as a normal number or like a special kind of way of writing zero, but uh, many ancient civilizations had some kind of zero. But yeah, it, it was some kind of weird thing. And it was with the Indians that it sort of became a real thing. Uh, but um, yeah, so it took a long time to, to go into Europe. And even when it came to Europe, it took a very long time before it was w adopted by anyone except for like ver very well educated people. Um, th there, here's a proof of this. This is a, a woodcut, a picture of an astronomical clock that was in the cathedral in Uppsala. Uh, sadly, it got destroyed in the city fire in 1702. But this is this was my 300 years after the Hindu Arabic numbers came to Europe. And still, apparently, there was a need to have two clock faces to, so that you can see what the time was. Uh, and uh, also, clocks are interesting. They have kind of relics from ancient civilization, like the 24 hours in a day that comes from the Egyptian timekeeping system, and the 60s in, in minutes and uh, hours comes from Babylonian uh, base 60 system. Um, and these 24 and 60 are very practical numbers because they are highly composite. There are so many ways you could divide them into equal for into refractions, which is very practical for timekeeping, very practical for trade, and so on. So, of course, ancient civilizations knew a lot about uh, fractions, or, or as we call them today, rational numbers. So here's like a modern definition of rational numbers. As you remember from school, it's an ordered pair, p, q, of integers where q is not allowed to be zero. And we write them as p over q, where that like horizontal dash, it's related to division, but it's not division. The number is this pair of two integers. Uh, mathematicians say that rational numbers form what's called a field, which is a mathematical type with addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division in the normal sense. So we're going to go into that a bit more later. Uh, so let's try to implement rational numbers in C++ and see what we can learn from that. Because C++, it, it doesn't have a rational number type for runtime use. So uh, let's see, implement our own. So we can start simple with two ints to approximate the integers and it makes sense to initialize it to zero right uh, it's useful to be able to convert from an int to a rational so we can create a constructor from that and of course you want to be able to construct a rational number from two ints and then there there there's a precondition of course x1 is not allowed to be zero that's not a valid rational number uh, so you can check that in various ways, but what I did here was I used this new, new uh, con C++ contract contracts syntax. Uh, Bjorn Faller has talked about this before in the meetup group. Great talk. Uh, but I don't have a contracts enabled compiler yet, so I just put it behind comments. It's just, a <laughs> <laughs> just for the future. But even as documentation, I think this is quite clear. Uh, yes. Okay, so now we can go on to the fun stuff, implement some operators. And starting with the relational operators. Uh, first of all, equality, as you remember from school. Two rational numbers are equal if you can do this, when you do this crosswise multiplication of the integers. When these two integer products are equal, then the rational numbers are equal. Uh, which also means there can be many equal uh, definitions of the same rational number, one half and two fourths, three sixths, four eighths, it's exactly the same number, just a different representation. Uh, why is equality important? Well, of course it enables equational reasoning. We want to have put the rational numbers in equations and there's an equal sign in the middle of every equation, so uh, there's that. Uh, the laws of arithmetic for rational numbers are defined in terms of equality, so we need this there. A more like C++ programmers view of this is that equality enables linear search. If you have an array of rational numbers, I can put some 
number in a ra random position, you can find it again with the defined comparing for equality. Okay, so let's implement the equality operator. And already there's a problem, right? What happens if P and Q are large integers? Well, we could overflow, and that's undefined behavior, so it kind of breaks equality. So you have some design decision to do here, right? So you can maybe upcast it to bigger type. You could uh, try to store it in reduced form, factoring out all the common factors to keep the numbers low. Or you could use an unlimited precision integer type from some library, maybe. But I, I don't want to worry about that for now. So let's just assume we have small integers. Um, of course, when you have an equality operator, you always need to implement inequality operator as well. And there's a post condition on inequality, right? It's the complement of equality. When one returns true, the other one always returns false and the other way around. So you can probably say there's a post condition on equality as well. But the standard way is to just implement equality and you implement inequality by calling equality and negating the result. Um, because uh, like these two belong together, any sensible programmer will expect that they can use, if they can use one of them, they can use the other. Um, what's the name of that operator, by the way? Well, I think the C++ standard calls it not equals. Could be wrong. Uh, I found this. Uh, Dijkstra, the famous Dutch computer scientist, he was very particular about uh, word, uh, naming things correctly. It was very important to programming in his opinion. So he called this operator, uh, this is from a letter like beginning of 80s, I think, where he discusses what he's going to name his mathematical symbols in his future texts. And he calls it differs from, just to emphasize that just one may be implemented in terms of the other, but to the user they are symmetric. So you shouldn't think of inequality as being something kind of less importance or a less fundamental thing. I thought that was kind of interesting. Some properties of equality that always need to hold. Uh, if you implement the equality operator, an object always equal to itself, right? And if you can compare two objects that are equal, you should be able to compare them in the other order. And if you have three objects where the first is equal to the second, second is equal to the third, you never should need to check if the first is equal to the third. So if you ha have those properties, you have what ma mathematicians call an equivalence relation. And uh, there can be many interesting equivalence relations on some type. For example, even a stupid function that takes two objects and always returns true. Always, that will be an equivalence relation, but perhaps not that interesting. Uh, but yeah, if you want to write some unit tests or something for an uh, equality operator, these are things you should check. Uh, rational numbers are also ordered. There's total ordering. It's the same formula but with a less sign instead of equality. Which is also important for numbers. It enables fundamental algorithms with, in math, like taking the absolute value of a number, like is it bigger or smaller than zero? You need an ordering. It also enables sorting. So if you have, if you implement relational operators, you can store your objects in a stud set or uh, as keys in a stud map, so it becomes much more powerful type. Uh, and of course, if you can sort, you can do a binary search in, uh, in an ordered set, in, uh, in an ordered sequence instead of uh, linear search and find something much quicker. Okay. Yes? You assume that you have a zero. Uh, yeah, I, I don't assume it yet. <laughs> Perhaps I need zero. Perhaps I need zero. Yeah, I need more than uh, just ordering. That's true. I, yeah, I will come back to that. But it, it's one of the things you need is ordering. Okay, uh, implementation, pretty straightforward, but since there it's not symmetric, like it's not an equivalence relation, so you have the four operators instead of just two. The complement, greater than or equal. The converse, if you flip them, you get greater than. And the complement of converse, if you flip and negate, you get 
uh, less than or equal. So you only need to implement one, and the other three you just call that one. It doesn't matter which one you implement, but uh, the convention is to use less in C++. Um, okay, so what, what is this total ordering? It's there are many kinds of orderings, and maybe not all of them are important to know. But I think as for programming, there are two that are really the most important. It's weak ordering, first of all, which is our, it's transitive, just like an equivalence relation. So if x comes before y and y comes before z, then you don't need to check if x should always come before z. If you couldn't know that, then sorting would not be possible to implement in an efficient way, for example. And the other thing is the weak trichotomy law that says that you can compare any two objects, like any two rational numbers you can compare, and it's one of three cases. Either one, the first is less than the second, or the second is less than the first, or if none is comes before the other, then they are equivalent. In so there's some equivalence relation there. And the, and the other, the thing you need to do to make it a total ordering is simply to use equality as that equivalence relation. So this is like how all the, these relational operators tie together. Um, so in C++20 we will get this new spaceship operator. I think before you start playing too much with that, it's, you should know what a total ordering is uh, and think about using cor it correctly. Okay, so now we have like what <coughs> basics, what we need to implement addition, multiplication, subtraction, and division. Okay, so let's do a little detour here. So, this is a piece of pseudocode. It's obviously not C++. Might look like some language you know, but it's not. It's, I just made this up. So what do you think this would print? Sweden CPP, all right, it <laughs> makes sense. Uh, what about this one? Sweden, Sweden, Sweden. Yeah, mm -hmm. good. Um, what about this one? <laughs> Does it make sense? <laughs> uh, no, it's no, yes. It's regular, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it makes sense. I think it should print Sweden CPP. But let's wait a minute here. So, which one of these are correct? We have two operators, they do the same thing. That doesn't make sense, this is badly designed language. So which one should we pick? Yes? I just wanted to say the second should be a matrix. Ah. <laughs> yeah, that could be a possibility, yes. Yeah. So yeah, think about for a second which one you would pick and let's see if you got it right. So, I think standard string got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but. We're in good, bad company here because the same thing in Java, Python, all this list of popular languages all use plus for string concatenation. Uh, so how can it be wrong? That's a good thing, right? We have some tradition here. All these programming languages are consistent. So if you move to a new language that you're not familiar with, you will recognize what that plus means, right? Uh, but Sometimes traditions can be problematic. It, they could clash with other traditions. Uh, and there's a tradition in mathematics here that uh, says that whenever they use plus, whenever mathematicians use plus, it's usually used to denote a commutative operation. So yep. you, if you swap the or terms, you get the equal results. Uh, it holds for all the standard number types polynomials, you can add them together, it's commutative. Vectors, matrices, like gi give me any mathematical type that has plus. If it's not commutative, a mathematician would have to explain that and say, oh no, it's non-commutative plus. So what about strings? Is string concatenation commutative? With these two print the same string. So does multiply, the same rules apply to multiply. I'm gonna get to that. So what about mul <coughs> multiplication? Right? It's also commutative, right? Well, usually, yes. For all common number types that we learn in school, for polynomials, you can multiply by themselves or by a scalar. It's commutative either way. Vectors can be multiplied by scalars, also commutative. 
but matrices. <laughs> Remember matrix multiplication? Like you have to, you, you, every value in the res resulting matrix is an inner product. You take a row and a column and you multiply each the elements and then you add them together. Because of that, uh, in order to even be able to swap matrices, they have to be square matrices. And when you swap, you the rows and columns switch roles, so usually you don't get the same result, right? Uh, same thing, quaternions, they're using computer graphics and so on. So, like in general, if you don't know the type of X and Y there, you cannot be sure that it's a commutative operation. So, from that perspective, maybe multiplication is okay to use for strings for concatenation. You could, then you could use the same symbol to multiply by number or another string. Or, and also there's another tradition in mathematics that you usually don't print the multiplication sign, right? You say 3x, not 3 times x. And that you can do in C++ with string literals, right? You put a space between and they are concatenated at compile time. So, <laughs> if you ever implement a string type, so think about which tradition you <laughs> follow, right? How about the tradition that multiplication follows from a number of additions? Yeah, so uh, that that multiplication follows from a series of additions that holds for natural numbers, and not for all mathematical types, though. It could be a completely different thing, so yeah, something to think about. Um, so let's say you want to implement either multiplication or addition. So there's a much more important law that, than uh, commutativity. It's the associative law, like the second thing we second law of arithmetic that we learned in school. So if you have a series of uh, sequence of three or more and you want to add them all and multiply them together, you can put parentheses and do them in different order as long as you don't move them around. This is hugely useful for programming. Right? You should always look for associative operations in your code. And why is that? Well, let's look at simple examples. So here we have a sequence of strings separate words, and I want to reduce them all into a single sentence, single string. String concatenation is associative, right? It's very simple to see that. Um, which means that, yeah, we could do this, we could turn this into one string sequentially, but just appending a word at a time. But since it's associative, we can actually put parentheses. And we could do this to substrings in two or subsequences of strings in two separate threads or two separate processes or computers in a network, like whatever resources we have, we could parallelize this, right? And it's kind of trivial to parallelize. There's no shared state here. There's no need for locks or mutexes, any kind of synchronization. They are two separate parts. And when they're done, we just concatenate them together and we get the correct result because of associativity. And it doesn't depend on being strings or string concatenation. This could work for any type that has an associative operator. So mathematicians have a name for this very useful thing. They call it a semi-group. So how many know what a semi-group is? How many have, <laughs> yeah, a few, right? So it's, if you're n unfamiliar, it's a very, basic idea. So you can think of it as some data type, T, right? Together with a binary operation represented by that circle. So this could be plus, could be multiplication, could be any named function that takes two T's and r returns a T, combining them in some way. If that operation is associative, then that whole thing is called a semi-group. Um, now, T, it doesn't have to be a complete data type even. Like mathematicians think of it as a set. So it could be the subset of values within a type on some subset on which the operator is defined. So C++ is full of semi-groups. They appear everywhere, like int with plus or multiplication. A named function like std min, min is clearly associative as well. All the Boolean binary operators stood string with concatenation. Like in all these cases, you could do this parallelization trick, right? But not every type 
for example, floating point numbers are problematic. Uh, there are many problems with floating point numbers. <laughs> it could be a whole talk. Like the IEEE floating point standards are kind of designed by committed things where they forgot about basic mathematics, <laughs> more or less. So, which is a big problem. Like, it makes it hard to parallelize code with floating point numbers and get consistent results. Um, yeah. So many semi-groups also have an extra bonus feature and, yeah, sorry? Just a quick question. Is it fixable if you pay attention to the math or is it some technicality uh, that makes it... Yeah, I mean, it has to do with overflow and underflow and so on. There is research in that. There is... Uh, I looked into it a little bit. It's a difficult thing to change because it's implemented in hardware, <laughs> floating point numbers, but uh, yeah. There is a guy called John Gust Gustafsson. It's not he's not Swedish, even if his name sounds like that. And he has there's a type uh, unums, a type that is kind of there. there are, it's quite new it's things. Theoretically so theoret yeah, theoretically possible to to fix this, but it will take a long time to do it in practice. But yeah, um, yes. So many semigroups have this extra feature that there is a special value in the set, special value for a type, that when you combine that value with any value, it doesn't change anything. If you have that kind of value, you have what's called a monoid, and that's called an identity element, or E. So actually all of the examples of semi-groups that I had are also monoids because there's an identity element. For int and plus, it's zero. Right? You add zero, nothing changes. For multiplication, it's one. Multiply by one, nothing changes. For min, it's the biggest int. Right? The min of any int and the biggest int is the other one. Um, for strings, empty string. Right? Concatenate the empty string, nothing changes. Uh, so monoids are very common, very useful as well. One thing they do is they allow you to th deal with empty ranges. So think about like what's the sum of no integers? What's the string you get if you concatenate no strings? What should you return? Empty string. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's good to look for an ad identity element as well. And third law of arithmetic that we learn in school, how are multiplication and addition connected? It's a distributive law. You do multiplication first, uh, you, they, it distributes over addition. And of course, mathematicians have a clever name for this as well, called the semi-ring, which is simply a type with two operators, right? It's one we call addition, with zero being the identity, one we call multiplication, with one being the identity, so they are both m monoids. The plus is commutative. The uh, uh, identity elements are distinct from each other and the distributive law holds. So if you have that whole thing together, it's a the type is a semi-ring. So again, like classical int with normal addition multiplication. Uh, bool, where you use or as addition and and as multiplication. Like and distributes over or. That's a Boolean semi-ring. Uh, Another famous one is a uh, sort of tropical semi-ring where you use min as your plus and you use plus as your multiplication. So like plus distributes over min. This is a good like exercise to convince yourself that works. <laughs> These are, yeah. So it doesn't have to be literally plus or multiplication, but here, yeah, sorry. Have you seen any use of that model? Yes, definitely. This is... Uh, this tropical algebra, it's, uh, you can use it for pathfinding algorithms, for example. Okay. It's, yeah, it's worth looking into. It's quite cool. Um, okay, so th this is like old theory for now, uh, or abstract algebra. Uh, so uh, now let's look like, how do you add to rational numbers? We learned how to do that in school. You have to have common denominators, so you multiply them, and then you have to multiply on top to uh, compensate, so it's kind of an expensive operation, right? You have three multiplications and one addition just to multiply the rational numbers. 
and it also makes them quite a bit, these integers a bit large. So, but this is both commutative and associative, and there's an uh, identity element, the rational number zero. So here's like the proof of that. You can easily see it's just on either side. You just be get the other one. Um, so we implement addition exactly as in math textbooks. Multiplication is easier, cheaper to do than addition. You just multiply the p's and the q's and you get the product. Also associative and commutative and identity element one. There's the proof of that. So we have multiplication. So we have addition multiplication. So now we have a, a new semi ring of this rational number type. But we also want to be able to subtract. It's the same formula as addition, but with a minus on top. So we could implement it like that, but there's a more general way to do it also. So for that you need to go one level up from a monoid into a group. And a group is just a monoid with another extra feature that you have for every element you can find an inverse element. And when you combine them, they cancel each other. So the result is the identity element. So the only one here that is qualifies as a group, kind of, is int with plus. Because yeah, you have a positive int, you find the negative int, and then you combine them and they become zero. There's a slight problem there, though. Like, do you see it? How are ints implemented, usually? Exactly, it's a two's complement. There's one extra negative int, the smallest one that has no inverse. Okay, so we have to sort of, okay, yeah. We, we don't care about that one. <laughs> we, yeah, but like overflow is also a problem and that's, yeah. But it doesn't mean that addition is broken or s anything like that. We are worrying about overflow and this kind of bad things happening at the limits. Uh, we're used to dealing with that. So. So, but what's the point of a group? Well, imagine you have a group, your operation is plus. What is the name of the function that gets you the inverse element in C++? Unir minus. Unir minus, yes. So an additive group is just a group with plus and zero, where the additive inverse is a unir minor. So uh, this function additive inverse is just a bogus function call. You, you have what you have to do there is whatever you have to do for the type to find the inverse element. Uh, it's built in, of course, for int. Um, okay, but if you have that unir minus, you can implement s a proper subtraction just by taking the first em element plus the negation of the other one. Okay, so we could do this for rational numbers, it works. So we have to, how do you negate a rational number? Well, you just negate the numerator. Okay, and it turns out it's a, exactly the same thing to, to add the negative uh, rational, number, rational number. So let's implement it like that. So we have the unit operator minus, we just negate the numerator, and we implement my, the binary minus with plus and the unit minus that we already did. Uh, so and that function is different from the previous ones. It, it doesn't use the p's and q's directly. So, and this should work for any group, any additive group, I should say, not just rational numbers. So we could consider making this a template, right? So g is some additive group type. We could implement minus for any such t. But I, I don't really like the type name keyword. It doesn't say anything about the type. And of course, this is something where, this is where concepts come in. It's this new C++ feature where you can design a concept that says it, uh, describes that the type has to have a plus and a minus, for example. But if you, if you don't have concepts yet, if you're not familiar with them, it, that's okay. We can sort of cheat. So I'm gonna just make a macro. <laughs> And say that again, yeah. so ty additive group is just a different name for type name. So then we can put, say additive group there. It's just documentation, but it's, it's good. It actually is better than a type name. And then later when you have concepts, maybe you can implement the concept and check that and get better error messages. Okay, so I'm gonna do this in the rest of the talk. Like if you see something other than type name, just read this type name. 
Um, okay. So now we have the minus, and that means our rational type forms a ring. So the semi, the, the missing part, was that the addition uh, was just an additive monoid, not a group. So they were not inverses, but we have inverses with now a group, and then it's called a ring. So the rational numbers form a ring, and the traditional, or the, like the canonical example of a ring is the integers. Ints you can add, subtract, multiply, and you get an int. Uh, but integers have more properties than just this. So they form what's called an integral domain, something integer-like. Uh, so an integral domain is a ring where multiplication is commutative. And there's another thing, another property that I think it can be expressed in different ways, but uh, one way is to say there are no zero divisors. So if you multiply two ints and the result is zero, you know that one of them or both are zero. Or conversely, if you multiply and the result is not zero, none of, none of them could have been zero. And that leads to division. So that's rational number division. Yeah, it's just multiplication of the integers, but you do it this crosswise way. And of course, it's undefined if the numerator becomes zero. So P1 cannot be zero because it's an integral domain. If P Q zero can also not be zero, but then you didn't have a rational number to begin with there in the top. Um, but you could have division by zero if P1 was zero, and that's undefined. So division has a precondition again, like it's, yeah, you're not allowed to divide by zero. And that's now all we have, uh, that leads to a field. So the rational number is a field, it has all these four operators in this particular way. So field is just an integral domain with a inverses for multiplication as well, except for zero. And you could, if you want to implement division, sort of like you did subtraction, but using multiplication instead of plus. OK, so that's a lot of words, a lot of rules to remember. And it kind of, it's hard to keep track of. So, but I think it helps to like, draw them in a diagram, like to see how they are connected to each other and how they are related to the uh, operators for the, uh, uh, like this. And these, I Call, we'll call an algebraic concept. So like this new feature, concepts, what does it come from? Is it just something the standards committee wants to have to improve compile times, to get better their error messages with templates? No, literally the idea of concepts comes from abstract algebra. So it's, it's modeled after this very kind of useful idea from mathematics. Uh, and mathematicians don't call them concepts, they call them algebraic structures. But it's the same thing almost. Co concepts also say something about computational complexity, so we want this to be fast as well, which many mathematicians don't care about that, but they should probably. Uh, but yeah, so, so this is a like, good way how to think about concepts, they come from mathematics. Okay. So, so we armed with this, all this theory, we could look at this rational number type and think about generalizing it. Right, so we put an int, but we didn't, none of the operators used int directly. They just used equality, less than, addition, negation, and multiplication, and they assume those properties, right? So we could make this whole rational number into type into a template as well, where you should work on any integral domain, i. So it could be like a library integer type, for example, something you make up yourself. Uh, and there's no change, you would have to templatize the operators as well. Uh, but this is very great. But there's one extra thing here that I don't really like. Okay, so it's this. There's an extra property. We so to require the type i to have a constructor that takes int, or can convert to int, and where the integer literals 0 and 1 mean the additive and multiplicative identity elements, like the 0 and 1 is for whatever that integral domain type is. So maybe we don't have that. 
So what can we do to fix that? Well, we could replace 0 and 1 by 0 and 1, written as text <laughs> instead. OK, so what are the 0 and 1 here? Clearly, they are some kind of templates, because you have the angle brackets. Uh, clearly, they are still values, because you need values here, not types or anything else. Uh, but what you really should do is like take off your C++ classes, take on your math classes, <laughs> and look at that as a function call. Right? So 0 and 1 are some kind of mathematical function where you pass in the type i and it returns at compile time the, what 0 and 1 represents for that type. So this is a type function call. And you cannot implement that with a normal C++ function. They only take values, not types. But you can implement them using traits classes. This is what the standard library does a lot. Uh, so the function is actually a struct called 0tf for type function. Uh, it's a template struct which contains only a static constant called value, which I default initialize to calling the constructor with 0. So if s is an int, values is the number 0. Uh, but the beauty of this is, of course, that if you have some other type uh, where 0 is not uh, implemented like that, you could specialize that struct and provide your own value. Uh, and to access that, you would have to say 0 tf of s colon colon value. That's a little bit much to type, so I think it's nice to use variable templates that came in C++14 there. So that's, that's just, 0 is just a different name for that. So that's, that's what 0 was in the up there. It's just a static constant. And 1 is the same thing, default initialized to 1. But of course, rational numbers now. So, so now this works for int, for example. But rational numbers also have this 0 and 1. So we could specialize. We should provide this for rational numbers as well. So it's a little bit of a wall of code here. But first you have the specialization for 0. And here I put the definition outside. So this value is what rational default constructor returns. So it's 0 over 1. And 1 is 1 over 1 for that integer type. OK, so now let's sort of we create the rational numbers, and they are completely abstracted away what the integer type is. OK, so we could use, use this to implement a lot of other types without even knowing what specific int type you use. So what I did, I implemented this little C++ program. You can download it later if you're interested. It's, it's not a library or anything. It's just a single CPP file. No dependencies on anything but the standard library. It should work in all the three major compilers. And it just has some unit tests and a bunch of mathematical types. So I built this rational number type. And on top of that, for example, if you simple geometry, 2D geometry, you can construct a 2D vector, just x and y coordinates as rational numbers. And you add some uh, operators to make it a vector space, so you can do scalar multiplication and all that stuff. I implemented a 2D point type, of course making sure it's an affine space over the vector space. So <laughs> if you didn't see the talk by Adi Shavit and Björn Faller, you should really do that. It's a great talk. Um, and uh, with three rational numbers, you can represent any line. And you can see lines purely algebraically. You can check, are they uh, like, uh, uh, I forget the words. OK, anyway, yeah, yeah. Like if two lines cross, what's the point where they meet? You can create triangles. You can check the Pythagorean theorem, do all this uh, stuff. You can also do, I also implemented polynomials, just a std vector of numbers. It actually works on any ring. But if you plug in an integral domain, like int, the whole polynomial type becomes an integral domain, which means you could, well, and rational numbers are integral domains. So you could make polynomials out of rational numbers, 
but you can also make rational numbers out of polynomials if you want. So that's called a uh, rational function, and it's like very the type starts to produce themselves, <laughs> and this is very nice. This is very nice. Um, right, so you can do all sorts of stuff. But what if you don't even have the integers? Like, what if you only have natural numbers? Well, you can also implement integers, much like you do rational numbers. It's an ordered pair of natural numbers, m and n, written as this backslash you read is less, so it's m less n. It's kind of like subtraction, so you can think of Geometrically, you can think of m is going in the positive direction on the number line, and n is going in the negative direction. So you have minus 2 there. And like rational numbers, you could have m and n could be different lengths. So you can have many implementations of the same number. You have m and a new line. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So. We could implement integers, and it doesn't need to be a built-in natural number type like unsigned. It could be any kind of semi-ring that is similar. So we only need, we're only going to need addition and multiplication, <coughs> which is really interesting. So total ordering, those are the formulas. It's like uh, for rational numbers, but with plus instead of multiplication. So there's implementation, of, and the other four operators just call these two. The arithmetic to add, to add to integers, you do this, it's, it looks like multiplication does for rational numbers, but with plus instead. Multiplication is more complicated, but yeah. And negating, you cannot negate a natural number, but you just need to swap them. And then if you think about it on the number line, it makes sense. And then we could use our templated minus just using the plus and minus and negation. So implement those three. So now everything in this um, math C++ file still works just fine, just using natural numbers. So we could plug in unsigned, but let's have more fun. Okay, first of all, of course, the interiors also have uh, Identity elements, so these are, yeah, natural number 0 and 1. Okay, so let's go back to this. <laughs> could we, could all this math work with Stone Age math? Yeah, it actually could. So, I just extended it a little bit to include 0, which, yeah, maybe they didn't know about 0, but we like monoids, so we have 0, so a default constructor, we have the old constructor for Stone Age people, and we have a new constructor for us modern Renaissance people. So we pass in, and we can pass an unsigned as well. This is a nice feature. Yeah, exactly. So this is like C plus plus minus twenty thousand standard <laughs> <laughs> or something. Uh, yeah. So hopefully Stone Age people could understand this code. Uh, maybe. Uh, okay. How do we do the total ordering? How do we check if they are equal? Well. Strings are equal length, <laughs> then they're equal. Same number of dots, so that works. Less than, same thing. Just count the dots. Addition, how do you add? Well, that's actually string concatenation now. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh. 3 plus 5 is 8. Yeah, good. So we implement that. But remember, string concatenation is not commutative. And we want plus to be commutative. Well, actually it is, because we're not dealing with the general case of any possible string. We're just dealing with strings with the same character repeated, and then it is commutative. So that's nice. It works. Then we come to the problem, multiplication. So how, multiplication for natural numbers. That's repeated addition, right? And that's a lot of work if you have a lot of dots. So to multiply 12 times 3, it's like 11 string concatenations. It becomes, you need a computer to help you, right? So yeah, of course we can just do a, a simple naive loop. Computers are fast, so that's good. So we have our multiplication, it works. And we just need the type function. So empty string is 0, string with 1 dot is 1. 
So at this point, it's, I mean, it's, this is how the numbers types are built up logically. So it should be obvious, but it still kind of boggles me when I think about, okay, so I take like derivatives of a fifth degree polynomial or like checking Pythagorean theorem. And it's all done with some complex combination of string concatenations <laughs> and <laughs> checking the length of strings. That's all it does. Of course, really inefficient, slow, but it works. Just try it out. It's in the code. And yeah, that's kind of marvelous. Okay, but is it good enough? Okay, it's obviously it's super slow, inefficient, takes a lot of memory, but yeah. And, and where is the slow part? Well, it's this, right? There's a loop here. It has to be there that uh, we should optimize. <laughs> okay, so this is quite stupid to do it like this. Can we do it better? So remember, what's, what's the important property of string concatenation? It's associative, right? So if we want to multiply 12 times 3, we could do is this linear sil silly way. Or we could use threads, right? We split it into halves, and we get done in half the time. But that would be kind of stupid as well, <laughs> right? Because we're not dealing with the general case of different strings. We're dif we know that both of these will be equal. So why don't we throw away the threading and just do it? We just take the first one and we double it. Okay, so, but we're trying to implement multiplication. We cannot multiply it. That's a problem. But how do you double a number if you don't have multiplication? Just add it to itself. Okay, so we saved one, two, three, four, five string concatenations. That's good. Okay, so this works on even numbers because we could split in exactly in half. But maybe we want to multiply by 13. So that's a problem, right? So we have this extra one at the bottom. But we could still fix this. We could put that aside and round it down. So we have still 12 times 3, or 6 times 3 twice. And then it's just an extra one to add at the end for odd numbers. And since every natural number is either even or odd, we can do any multiplication. Uh, and the next logical step. What is that? Recursion. Recursion, yes. Use associativity. And we are down to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 instead of 12 concatenations. And as the numbers grow large, this becomes better and better. Okay, so how old is that idea, you think? It's very, very old. So this is uh, a piece of a uh, papyrus called the Rhine papyrus. I think it's about five meters long. Uh, it's over three and a half thousand years old. And it's, uh, it's full of examples of how ancient Egyptians did uh, arithmetic and uh, uh, geometry and so on. And it has this algorithm in it. Um, okay, so that looks very, very ancient to us. But actually, the idea must be much, much older because, well, this is the first written evidence, but ancient e Egypt lasted for a crazy long time. So to go back to these famous buildings, it's a millennium before that. <laughs> and I don't know, we don't have any actual proof, but I don't think it's a far fetch to think that Egyptian engineers knew something about multiplying large numbers mm -hmm. efficiently. Well, that's my theory anyway. So. Whoever invented this, it was a very long time ago. So here is that algorithm in sort of modernized <laughs> to C++, still using that old type, but it's just five lines of code. And it inclu includes zero as well, which the Egyptians didn't have in that way. But let's just look at them lines quickly. So first of all, if you're multiplying by zero, we're done. We just return zero. Second line. If we multiply by, if the first number is 1, we're also done. We just return the other one. Otherwise, we call ourselves recursively, passing in half of the first number, round it down, and twice of the other number, where we double just by adding to itself. And then we're done if we have an even number. But we might have an odd number, so we need to check that. In that case, we have to add one extra, and then we're finally done. And it's easy to see, like, how fast is this? What's the complexity of this algorithm? Log n, yeah, we divide by half, so we quickly get down to the base cases. So this, is, this makes 
This you could use in Roman numerals, for example. I, it makes uh, multiplication sort of feasible to do by hand, even in such a primitive system. And that's really nice, but it's also using two functions that I didn't implement, right? Half and is odd. So we need to do those. So how do you check, how do you divide in half? Well, you do a bit shift of the length, right? <laughs> That's rounding down. <laughs> no, it's perfectly okay. <laughs> so if you, th if you think about like, the binary representation of an uh, unsigned value, like if, if it's an even number, the, the least significant bit is a zero. So we, that sort of gets thrown out, but we don't lose any information. But if it's an odd number, we lose a one. So you can think of that one as representing that extra x that you have to add back in for odd numbers. And of course, to check if a uh, number is odd, check the least significant bit. But how do you bit shift a series of dots, of the string of dots? No, I take, I create a new number out of half the length. So it's, I'm not bit shifting that, I'm bit shifting there. But notice that these two functions are using uh, bit operations that are machine instructions really fast. So this actually is very simple. Those are simple to implement in binary hardware. So I'm not a hardware guy really, but as far as I understand, this algorithm is used by hardware people to implement multiplication in binary computers. It's a good way to do it. So, but it's good for software people to know as well, because we can do more with it. So, but I'm going to leave that as a challenge. So if you have not, if you don't know the answer to this, I really recommend don't look it up the result. Try it yourself and see what you can discover because it's really great exercise. Try to optimize this algorithm. So the first thing, you don't want recursion, right? So that costs memory and function calls, whatever. So try to convert this into a loop version. That is not trivial, so it's a that itself is a good exercise in turning recursion into loops, that's good to know. If you manage to do that, you will see that, maybe you see it already, there's a lot of unnecessary work here. A lot of checks, and if you have the loop version, you can sort of unroll the loop, knowing what you know about natural numbers, and you can optimize quite a lot. Uh, Actually, the, there's an answer to this in Knuth, in the Art of Computer Programming, the second book. K and Knuth's uh, solution is not optimal. You can beat him. If you try, it's, it's doable. I don't think it's, yeah. So work on it a bit and see if you can beat him. Well, it should make you feel good. Uh, then also think about how you can generalize this. What are those? What are the semantic requirements of x0 and x1? Are they even the <coughs> same? So what's the most abstract way you can represent this algorithm? That also leads to a lot of interesting stuff. So Half must be pretty hard to generalize. Yeah, it's, it depends very much on the type you have to think about. Uh, yeah, it, it's, so, it's such a deep thing, this. It looks, it's five lines of code, but it's it even leads to some like unsolved problems in mathematics. <laughs> yeah, it's worth uh, looking into. And uh, yeah, if you, yeah, sir. Yeah, I did want to interrupt you. No, uh, no, I'm that's sitting good. here waiting for the print function. Yeah, <laughs> 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 that, that's an extra exercise for you to implement. So take my code. Yeah. Uh, right. More inspira thi this is inspiration for this talk, and uh, I really recommend if you think this is fascinating stuff to check into this to YouTube series. Um, first guy I learned about from Harald actually in this meetup group a long time ago. So he knows who this guy is. I he's a mathematician uh, in the University of New South Wales, I think. Uh, very active on YouTube, has great courses on math from like even kindergarten level up. And so with this series it has, it has been going on for like 10 years and it has an agenda. He's, he has very interesting opinions uh, about modern mathematics and that many things are wrong with it. He doesn't believe the real numbers even exist or there's no working 
definition of real numbers actually it's just something mathematicians have sort of yeah not treated in a good way so you need to go back actually to older ideas and to rational numbers particularly so it's very interesting and uh, it's like a minority view in mathematics but to programmer I think it seems very sensible like we never we never used to real numbers it's always <laughs> something more discrete uh, and of course Alexander Stepanov also this uh, series of talks which was the basis for this book later really good he also goes into this abstract algebra fascinating history about all the people who developed it very fun to watch uh, useful stuff for every programmer and it's it's a big investment in time to watch this it probably take you a year to watch it so but I think it's well invest invested time I have not finished the first series okay um, more inspiration for this talk of course this meetup group so I think big thanks to everyone who has been filming this talks for three years now and like uh, Harald and Paul and Shilul and uh, Jörn and uh, yeah I forget a lot of people but uh, and we have this high quality videos there have been many previous talks that have some kind of relation this is not all of them I what I could fit in a slide so you can go into this these talks as well again rewatch them and dive into other areas of math uh, I think it's really cool that we, we have all these videos you're starting to build up this treasure trove of great information that you can build on and make new talks uh, like I did here some final takeaways I think it's good to know about total ordering I think it's good to know about associativity especially uh, I think when you overload operators don't be too creative it's the rules should be defined as they are defined in math and to some degree C++ otherwise you're gonna have a lot of su bad surprises uh, I think C++ is provides a good framework for exploring this abstract algebra and it's uh, like I think it's much more fun than doing problems in a math textbook to actually implement these math types and learn how they work in practice. And uh, I hope I convinced you that ancient elementary math is good to know about and study. So there's the links to the talk and to the source code. And that's the end of the talk. Thank you. Yes, question? Have you seen the proposal for linear algebra? Have we seen the proposal of linear algebra? No, not yet. I, that's interesting to look into and see, see what they, what choices they made. Yeah, yeah so I've seen a talk by, what was his name? Um, Guy, Guy Davidson, exactly. Yeah. He talked about it, but I have not looked at the proposal itself. Uh, yeah, it looks like more mathematical types, more mathematical algorithms are coming into C++. Uh, before it gets too wrong, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's now is the time to find the, the big bugs. Yeah, definitely. Thanks. Yep. Uh, it feels like your names zero and one mm -hmm. are very integer centric, and that they perhaps better would be named multiplicative identity and additive. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's uh, the 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 name zero one could be. A little bit suggesting a little bit too concrete a thing, <laughs> uh, but maybe maybe yeah, save space on slides. But it also maybe makes it, it might might look too abstract also to people. So I don't know, but yeah, I think it's uh, words do really matter. That's a <laughs> that's another example of that. I yes. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Someone needs to do a talk about category theory at some point here. I'm not. I don't understand it. It's yeah, monads and yeah, whatever. But yeah, yeah, th there might be good names there uh, to look into. Um, there's a lot of this. Yeah, category theory. A lot of modern mathematics is based on set 
theory and that has been it's a dogma and uh, there's many strange and uh, bad things about sets so there's a lot of mathematicians are trying to use category theory or type theory or yeah all this it's a difficult thing to change <laughs> all the mathematical community's view but yeah it we might have been led astray a bit with sets uh, does an infinite set even exist it's like yeah can you do an infinite amount of work <laughs> oh. very deep questions <laughs> Yeah, still a lot of new things to discover. Yes, question? That question might be completely off. Have you looked into like a formal proof of uh, the methods that you implemented? Formal proof? Of no, I have not. I'm like, I don't mean even know if it would yeah. be feasible, but I think it's very interesting to look into. Yeah, it, it, is, it is definitely interesting to look into. But I'm not familiar with the field. So no. I mean, I no, know and it's yeah. Proofers, but they probably don't mm. work with this is like uh, C++ code, so. Yeah, exactly. C++ doing form proof C++ is not a good language, I think. <laughs> but yeah, uh, and this is like I yeah, talked about Dijkstra. He was very much about formal proofs and uh, <laughs> things. But it, it's yeah, I don't know enough about that subject either. So, uh, but I think it, it, just the fact that it works like it does with this kind of crazy type. It's some kind of sign that things are correctly <laughs> defined, I think. But yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you.